Welcome to Infrastructure Matters by IPWA, a podcast where we discuss all things infrastructure, asset management and public works. My name is David Jenkins and I'm the Chief Executive of IPWA and I have the fortunate job of talking to inspiring and passionate thought leaders from around the globe. Our podcast is a chance to reflect, hopefully learn something new and get a glimpse into the great minds of our profession and their personal journeys. Today, we'll explore the philosophy of asset management, its crucial role in governing billions of dollars of infrastructure and the innovative strategies being employed globally and particularly in Australia. We'll delve into the challenges, the triumphs and the future direction of asset management and what it means for our communities and future generations. So whether you're a professional in the field, a policymaker or someone with a keen interest in how our public infrastructure is shaped and maintained, this episode promises to offer valuable perspectives and thought provoking discussions. Sit back, relax, and join us as we uncover the intricacies of infrastructure asset management and the brilliant minds behind it right here on Infrastructure Matters. So without further ado, let's delve into our second episode of the series. I'm absolutely delighted to have Ashe Prabhu here today with us. And currently, um, let me tell you a little bit about Ashe. Ashe stands as an international advisor to the Government Finance Officers Association, the GFOA. This prestigious association, known for its acronym, acronym, GFOA, plays a vital role in shaping the landscape of government financial management. Within this role, Ashe is deeply involved in the development of best practice and policies and guidelines that encompass strategic asset planning, financial budgeting, long-term asset management, and climate analysis within the government sector. So, Ashe, it's good to have you here. Thank you for coming along. Thank you, um, David. And... The first question I just wanted to start with, um, I think we can all agree that um, asset management is is a philosophy. Um, so why is it so important? Why is it so, un- why is it so important for people to understand asset management? Governments own billions and billions of dollars of infrastructure that we use on a daily basis, whether it's a train to get to work or the roads we drive on, the park assets we use for active recreation, they have to be here for the future generations, delivering the level of service they deliver into the future. But this infrastructure also wears out. And often governments will get to a point where the rate at which they are getting eaten up or consumed will be far greater than our capacity to pay for the, for pay for the replacement. Mm-hmm. And that's the point at which the panic button hits. And to avoid that, is what asset management is important. So those billions and billions of dollars of infrastructure getting consumed at millions of millions of dollars a year can be prevented and can be preserved at the lowest life cycle cost. And that's why for governments now, strategic asset management has become a a very critical element and a voice in the boardroom. Mm. I mean, you would know more than most just the history that Australia has been on. Um, and it all comes back to long-term financial sustainability. And we have a national framework, um, consistent framework across states for, with regards to asset management. But where do, you, where do you think Australia is on the curve? Because we're still seen, and, 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 and you've got a viewpoint, an international viewpoint, Australia's still seen as a, a leader in infrastructure asset management. Are we still a leader? And where, where is Australia on that curve now? David, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked it. I'll answer it in in a different way. When you look back at history and why strategic asset management evolved and got developed here in Australia, it's because back then in the late 80s, we had 20 million people, roughly 3 million were paying tax and a significantly vast infrastructure to maintain. So we had to do more and more with less and less, unlike the Americans or in the Middle East where they had a lot of cash to splash and fix things when they break. And that's where strategic asset management evolved to say, how do I spend that scarce dollar that I have in the best possible fashion so I end up with the least amount of poor assets in the future? And I feel personally the Australian local government fraternity has done an absolutely outstanding job, and you only have to look at the proof point in the National State of the Assets report Mm. that the IPWEA and the OLGA put out every three years. Australia's position in terms of the assets in very poor condition is about 3%. And 3% is still a staggeringly big number when you look at, when you think about it in terms of interest rates 
or infrastructure in poor condition, one in every 33 assets required attention. But when you compare that with 7% in the United States, or very recently when I was in South Africa, a staggering 15%, or in the UK where it is 11%, we're in this fortunate position that we have been able to preserve, and that goes down to fundamentally to the best practice policies in Australia. And we are, I think, still leading the charge because when you look at the IPWEA practice notes, for example, or the uh, momentum on climate change to be part of the asset plan, the integrated planning frameworks in every state that are mimicking the national asset management framework, the regulation in many states where local governments are required to have a long-term asset management plan that spans a minimum of 10 years. And last but not the least, the only jurisdiction in the world that has an accounting standard which uses 99% of inputs from an asset management plan. And when you combine all that together, I think there is a recipe for uh, providing this on, on a global basis uh, so we can collaborate with our other Western counterparts to, to really embrace this philosophy of asset management. So I still think we are leading the charge. But if you were to put a, a report card together, right, you're doing a, a yearly report on Australia and um, its progress in, in, in asset management, and there's always the, the good things and then there's the could be done better. Yeah. And, and what, so in terms of a constructive feedback, what is it? that can be done better? Well, there's, there's a number of things, but the, the real most important thing is, I think Australian governments have now got access to a phenomenally rich uh, asset data that can be used to analyze the future of infrastructure better. Um, we have the, the blessing of an accounting standard that requires the, um, the basis of an asset management plan that gets audited on that basis. Um, but again, there's always, there's always shortcomings. Uh, we got a scathing report here in Australia, in Queensland, for example, that said 30% of local governments uh, do not have a proper asset register. Uh, but when you compare that on a global basis, uh, the asset registers that we have and the attribution that it has and the ability of those registers to make decisions is still miles and miles ahead uh, of anywhere in the world that I have, I have personally seen. And that is not to say that the United States or the UK or South Africa or New Zealand do not have great asset registers. That's not the be all end all. But, but there is a lot of work yet to be done where we shift our thinking purely from accounting and long-term financial planning perspective to now say, how can we bring climate into the equation? How can we bring natural assets into the, into the debate along with infrastructure? So those are structural improvements I see in terms of uh, asset management in this country. I want to pick up on the, the climate change aspect in a minute, but, th but I, I wanted to sort of just uh, flip things around. How, I mean, I come from, I'm a non-engineer, um, but I have a young family and I care about the future world that they're going to be living in. How, it, uh, you know, we'll have people on this, podcast that will be listening um, be technical experts there'll be people directors of infrastructure there'll be our members but there'll be there might be people listening here from the community level why just explain at a very fundamental level why is this why is infrastructure asset management so important for for the community to understand great question if i look behind you david and out of, out of the window over there, and I take a one degree line of sight as far as the human eye can see, there's about 10 to $20 billion worth of infrastructure that is sitting there. Basically meaning for our children and grandchildren and the current generation, that is the cost of replacing if it got wiped out tonight. Every billion dollars that is out there is getting eaten up at about 20 million a year. That 20 million a year is about $4,000 by the time we finish this podcast, which is a picnic shelter or a barbecue or a bay of footpath. The opportunity for governments is to cut that consumption down from $4,000 an hour to $3,000 an hour or $2,000 an hour just through better practice asset management to stop that rate of wear and tear. And why? Because if we don't, 
And if that very poor percentage in Australia starts to creep from 3% to 4%, 4% to 6%, then we will have no choice but to throw more and more good money or raise taxes or simply say to the community, we just simply can't deliver in, into the future. And, and that argument then becomes really difficult. So as community members, there is an obligation where we as the community need to be in charge of, of pressing this, this message to our governments so our governments can demonstrate that our tax money is being spent in the wisest possible fashion. And that's why for a community's perspective it's important because money doesn't have to be printed if we are smart about it. Taxes don't have to be necessarily raised if they're spent in the right fashion. And knowing that is, is, is really a community um, uh, accountability as well as, as, well as expectation. Uh, and, and I think the community needs to know that because future generations have to, have to survive with, with this infrastructure. So if, if you think about the people that, 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 that manage our infrastructure and you know, the purview that we have is, is predominantly local government, it's a tough job because you've talked about climate change that's impacting you know, climatic events, bushfires, flooding. But that's one input. You've got changing population demographics. You're making decisions now that will impact on the long term in a short-term political cycle. Correct. So how how do you, as an infrastructure asset manager, how do you grasp and, and grapple with all those issues and still provide a solution? Because most infrastructure, as you know, is indelible. You make a decision that's going to have an impact so, you know, further, down the, further down the line. So how do you, how do you think that through? Yeah, and again, all of those factors, whether it's climate change, whether it's demographic shift, whether it's the fact that our pavilions are no longer functional because female participation is almost impossible in some of the sports uh, fields that we currently have, or gender equity comes into play when you look mm -hmm. at the play spaces in the playgrounds, or simply our community facilities, the expectation might be that they have to be more adaptable. All of these are factors that should influence the asset management plan. And 25 years ago, as a young practitioner, whilst we knew what could happen, we were not in a position to explain the consequence, the future consequence of today's decision to our elected members, to our politicians, because we didn't have the rich data we have now. And we certainly weren't great storytellers like we are now. So the modern practitioner needs to bring that into play to present the story of the future, to bend the politicians from 60% discretionary decision-making to less than 20%. So major majority of the decision-making is non-discretionary based on future demand, future demographics, and climate change. And the way to do that is to provide the options. The options to say, if we always want to keep our infrastructure above the 3% in poor mark, it's gonna cost us an extra $11 million a year for this particular city. And if I don't have that $11 million, how do I trade off with what I've got to balance the budget? And how do I then communicate that to my ratepayers through my elected members so the asset management plan is realistic? Now that's not easy mm -hmm. because you're dealing with anywhere from 10,000 to 250,000 ratepayers. And more importantly, the hurdle before that, you're dealing with 11 to 15 councillors. And that education is important. And that's where I think, David, Australia has done a great job through programs that IPWA has run in coaching, capacity building, and training of politicians, elected members, down to the person in the field. And why I say that with pride is because compared to 20 years ago, we now have mayors putting out newsletters and publications where there is an entire paragraph on the benefit of renewal compared to building new assets. That never happened 20 years ago. We now have elected politicians, particularly in transportation and rail, that are asking us to provide them with scenarios of what would they get in return from a community perspective, if they invested an extra 20 billion in transport as opposed to, say, health? And they are great questions. And if the politicians have started asking those questions, that means, that means something must be working 
in terms of making that shift. And it's never going to be 100-0 in terms of discretionary, non-discretionary. But if we can get it to about 40-60, I think we've won. And this is an area that we're both passionate about, the people element. Yeah. And I still, I still feel, and we've discussed this many times before, and you've talked about the capacity and capability, I still feel that um, it's a forgotten element or should be the priority around the people side of things needs to change. Do you agree? I absolutely, completely agree. In fact, when I was in South Africa, when one of the mayors asked me what it is that needs to change in South Africa to embrace this, my answer was capacity building for skills is vital, but it's also the culture and the culture of civic pride, where it ha the people have to say, this is my city and I love to work here and I love to put pride back into that rubbish bin or that footpath or that pipe. And that has to come from, from people feeling that they belong and, and people feeling connected with the infrastructure. And that's part of capacity building. Mm. Okay. Civic sense. As we wrap up the first part of our fascinating discussion on infrastructure matters, we've explored the critical role of asset management in maintaining our invaluable infrastructure, Australia's leadership in this domain, and the pressing need to integrate climate considerations into our strategies. We've heard from Ashay Prabhu, an expert with a wealth of knowledge and experience, on how strategic asset management can shape the future of public infrastructure. But our journey into the depths of infrastructure asset management doesn't end here. Stay tuned as we dive into the second part of this episode. We delve deeper into how various professions can collaborate to revolutionize asset management. The future of this field with emerging technologies and get personal insights from Ashe on his motivations and invaluable advice for young professionals in the sector. So grab another coffee and join us as we continue this enlightening conversation and uncover more about the changing landscape of infrastructure and the innovative minds driving this evolution. <laughs>